So let's talk about scanning past intrusion detection, past a firewall. There are some IDS and firewall evasion techniques. Fragment your packet so the signatures don't look obvious. Choose source routing. Have decoys. Spoof addresses and use a proxy. So for spoofing, the problem, of course, with spoofing is that um, if I pretend to be some other source, you're not going to talk back to me. Maybe I don't care. Maybe that's OK. So you could directly, if, you're, if, you're tr if we're trying to find out if somebody is spoofing, if there's a machine on the network, we could try to ping a legitimate host and wait for a reply. We could use direct time to live probes. And then we check to see if the sent and received time to live values match. Check the end. So what happens is um, if I ping you and you ping me and you reply back, my time to live and your time to live should match. Or they should match what is expected of an operating system, the operating system we use. I could also check actual hop count. If you're three hops away, and you're responding, um, and um, you say that you're not three hops away, there's something suspicious about that. So directly probing a potential spoofer, that's one way. We could also check something called the IP ID number in the IP header. Just like TCP has sequence numbers, the IP ID number will increase with each packet sent. So we could send a probe to the suspect. Legitimate packets should have their IP IDs close to and slightly higher to the sent packet. They should just slowly go up. But a spoofed IP packet, the IP ID will not be anything close to the probe packet. And this will be true even if we are on the same subnet. We could also use the TCP flow control method. So you know the, you, we know from Network Plus that the window, the receive buffer, tells the sender how much I can handle before you need to stop and wait for me to acknowledge and flush out my buffer. And um, if you hit that point, and it's not going to be much, you're supposed to wait, not keep on sending me stuff. And if you, if you are continuing to talk, then you should have zero bytes. It should be just like an, an ACK packet with nothing in it. And that's it. But only a legitimate host will do that. A spoofer is not going to do that. They're going to keep sending stuff even if you, you can't handle it, even if your receive buffer, your, your window size is set uh, and they've exceeded it. You can also, um, so anyway, you can use this. Uh, legitimate senders are supposed to stop sending if the receiver's ACK window size is set to zero, meaning, hey, I can't take any more. A spoof packet will not stop. They'll send an ACK, uh, they might send an ACK, but they'll have additional data in it. So how do we have countermeasures against spoofing? Well, don't rely upon IP-based authentication. Uh, that means, in other words, um, don't accept them just because they're in a list of trusted hosts. Make sure all of your transmissions are encrypted. Use firewalls. Have filtering in and out. If possible, use random initial sequence numbers. TCP, by default, starts with zero always. But you might be able to have some applications that start on some other number. Um, have countermeasures in place for SIM floods. You either have something further upstream choking all the, and filtering out all that traffic, or you have load balancing that can absorb that much. Now, a proxy, as we know from Network Plus, is an intermediary between the server or servers or the internet and the end users. The way proxies are used legitimately is I've got the internet out here, I've got clients here, and I have a proxy in the middle. Usually the proxy is behind the firewall on the client side. When clients want to go to the internet, they're actually configured to go to the proxy who says, just wait, I'll get it for you. The proxy will check a list and see if it's permissible. If it's permissible, while keeping this session on hold, the proxy goes out and fetches the, the page hands it off to the client, and keeps a copy, caches a copy in case anybody else wants it. That's the legitimate internal use of a proxy. But in hacking, we use proxies for a whole other method. We use them as relays 
to hide the original source, us. So if we are an attacker and we have a target, rather than attacking the target directly so they can trace it back to us, we'll bounce it through a proxy and probably bounce it through several proxies. So it's hard to trace back ultimately to us. That's what an anonymizer does on the internet. So we use proxies on the internet especially, although we saw um, that we can do proxies even just locally, to hide the source address to d avoid discovery and avoid the fact that, um, uh, avoid people noticing that we've been hacking. It masks the actual source of an attack. Um, it provides a false source. Uh, we can remotely access intranets and website resources that are remotely protected. We can interrupt all requests sent by a user and reroute them to a different destination, making it uh, see only the proxy server address. We could chain or daisy chain multiple proxies to make it even harder. There are free proxy servers out there all over the internet, and um, you can use them. You can use any search engine to find them. So several different approaches to using a proxy. We could be here and um, maybe I want to get out to Facebook, but the firewall isn't allowing it. So I'll go to a proxy server on the internet that looks like a normal web server and the proxy goes to Facebook and then responds back to us. So that would be one way. Um, an anonymizers, of course, uh, allow us to hack or attack and it's hard to go back to us and we can chain proxies as well one after another daisy chain them Different proxy tools proxy switcher hides the IP address from the website that we are visiting proxy workbench Displays data passing through it in real time and allows us to look at the connections view the history save to a file view socket connection information Tor So the dark web right? allows privacy protection and defense against network surveillance and traffic analysis. CyberGhost uh, allows protection and online privacy to allow anonymous browsing and access to blocked or censored content. Hides the IP allows replacement with the, uh, an IP of the user's choice. Many other tools. Burp Suite, this is actually just a, a built-in uh, browser proxy. Bunch of others here, SoxChain. There are proxies for mobile devices as well. Anonymizers, there's all sorts of anonymizers on the internet so that it's hard to tra trace back to the hacker, but legitimate users also use it to bypass censor censorship. And there are loads of tools, absolutely loads of anonymizing tools. There's also something called gzapper. It blocks Google cookies, it cleans Google cookies. It helps you stay anonymous while searching online. Um, so you can have two protection methods. Uh, gzapper will detect and clean uh, the Google cookie every time because if you don't, Google will start feeding you stuff that you frankly don't care about. You know, that cookie, they use that cookie to check you against their database and pretty soon you start seeing ads and other things that you don't want to see. So that's what that gzapper is all about. Uh, it works with, um, well, IE, Firefox, Chrome. And it works with Gmail, AdSense, and other Google services. Because uh, Google stores a unique identifier in a cookie on your PC, which lets them track your keywords. So if you're, if you're finding that you're getting really annoyed because they keep on presenting things to you, you go to search something once and now you keep getting ads about it and, and it, it comes up as like being at the top of your list. Just use the gzapper so it looks like you're brand new every single time. They don't have any history on you. So um, the thing is, is that uh, information from Google cookies can be used as evidence in a court of law. The Google cookie is not set to expire until the year 2038, which is why Google really can control what we see and do. But gzapper will get rid of all of that. You look like a brand new user with no history with, with Google. Great tool. Proxy chaining is merely daisy chaining proxy servers, going from one to the next to the next. So, um, you can have as many proxies as you can or as you want and the client request uh, wants to go to a destination and, and, and just bounces from proxy server to proxy server. The server will strip out the client ID and pass off to the next server and this is repeated as many times as you have proxy servers in the chain. And um, in the end, a requ the request is actually passed to the web server. 
Now, most proxies have you have an encrypted connection to the proxy. But if your original connection is meant to be unencrypted, then the last connection to the web server is also unencrypted. So how about the dark web, Tor? Um, so Tor works like this. Alice has a Tor client. She gets a list of Tor nodes from a directory server. And so first of all, I get a list of possible Tor nodes. Alice will then pick a path based on all of these nodes to finally get to her final destination. And that path will change. It'll ra randomly change. So within the dark web, the connections are encrypted. And finally, the last connection is in, the, in clear, clear text. If at a later time, Alice wants to visit the same site, the path will be very different. This makes it much harder for people to trace back to you. So that is scanning beyond IDSs and firewalls.